welcome to all of you for coming this evening. Uh, we have, uh, we're very, very pleased to welcome Jonah Montgomery, uh, Senior Lecturer in Economics and Deputy Director of the Political Economy Research Center at Goldsmiths to address us tonight at the Development Studies and Bloomsbury DTC for the Social Sciences uh, Seminar Series. Jonah's published widely on financialization, debt, and the household, and is the lead author of The Politics of Indebtedness, a Public Interest Report, co-author of the book Financial, Financial Melancholia, Health, Mental Health and Indebtedness, and her latest publications include A Feminist Moral Political Economy of Uneven Reform in Austerity Britain, and Caring for Debts, How the Household Economy Exposes the Limits of Financialization. Her research interests are in all forms of household debt, mortgage, student loans, consumer credit, payday lending, and its relationship to Anglo-American financialization. Um, if you would like to tweet this evening, uh, the hashtag to use is SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. And we're also very pleased to welcome Professor Ben Fine with us to provide some discussant comments on Jonah's presentation. He's a professor of economics here at SOAS. So without further ado, Jonah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, so the, um, the presentation I have prepared uh, is for a, an upcoming book project that I'm working on. So I was really just trying to complete the, the proposal that goes in next week um, for this Future of Capitalism series from Palati, uh, which is about kind of publishing short 25,000 word kind of pamphlet style provocations that are future looking uh, in terms of what are some of the ideas that, that we can think of in, in, a, in a time of great global uncertainty. Uh, so this was my kind of proposal was about debt cancellation as a kind of cure for uh, the never ending crisis of financialization. Now this um, book project comes uh, at the end of, uh, well, a long period of study beginning uh, in my doctoral work on debt, but a more recent project that looked at the kind of crafting and alternative politics of debt, which was really about looking at since 2008, uh, all the different kind of organizations, community groups, policy uh, organizations, think tanks uh, that began to kind of recognize the role that debt was playing not just in, in, in crisis, but also in the austerity period. And really working with them in the first instance to kind of uh, begin to develop a common platform and later on to kind of begin to take a better account of the ideas that they were coming up with, the types of policies, politics, and, and social movements that were emerging as the kind of problem of debt became uh, ever present in the wake of financial crisis and as austerity set in. So really the, the kind of premise of this work is about looking at the central role that debt plays within uh, financialization. Not just the big global system of debt, rather than just pulling this one thread of household level debt and looking at the lens of the, through the lens of the household, how debt is a kind of transformative force. Uh, the book proposal itself tries to make a very pragmatic case for debt cancellation in the sense that in this period of uncertainty when um, there is so uh, there is such division and uh, infighting politically, uh, I'm trying to track towards pragmatism as a way not to say that debt cancellation will cure all problems of a financialized system, but rather that pursuing a path of debt cancellation provides the means to begin to reignite a kind of new imagination about possible economic futures. Um, okay, so it begins uh, with a kind of basic understanding of the debt economy, but importantly the way in which the debt economy and indebted society are not two separate spheres of, uh, of kind of economic activity. So if we begin with the debt economy, what we start with is how money is made and the business of money making under financialization. So we take, I'll take the example of the UK because it is the, the, the literally where we, where we are right now. But again, I'm interested in how the Anglo-American model, the, the, the kind of leading of the US and the UK in this kind of global push towards finance-led growth. But also I would include Europe in here uh, in, to various degrees and iterated through different national contexts. Uh, but generally the debt economy has a foundation that is in debt money. 
So this is the, the I'm not sure how many of you uh, read a lot about banking, but basically this is about the disintermediation of, of banking. So it used to be the case that banks uh, took savings deposits and through a fractional reserve system would lend, lend multiples of this savings deposit on to lenders. So the bank intermediated between savers and borrowers and that was their sort of bread and butter business. But what ha what's happened, which really has been traced to the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement, but really becomes intensified with uh, information and communication technology and the kind of digitalization of, of global banking is that um, effectively disintermediation has become uh, the originate and distribute model of banking, which means that creating debt is how you create money. So effectively, when, I issue, when a bank issues a loan, let's say it's for 250,000 pounds for a mortgage, or it's 50,000 uh, pounds line of credit, or a 10,000 pound loan for a car. That, act, that debt contract, making that contract, actually creates money. So 95%, even estimates up to 97% of pound sterling is actually exists as debt deposits, not as, as currency. Uh, so it exists as a claim, a debt claim, and a debt contract. Um, so that means that debt, uh, banks create money by issuing debt. So banks are literally in the business of making money, which is why it's an incredibly profitable business. Um, now, it's important to understand that just issuing that money does not in and of itself uh, make the debt contract an asset. What makes the debt contract an asset is when present day income is paid on that debt in the form of interest. So has anybody ever had the wonderful experience, that you'll give away your, that you're a homeowner if you do this, of having a pre-approved loan? Yeah, so a pre, okay, there you go, maybe not. <laughs> uh, so a pre-approved loan, you know, the bank sends you a notice saying you have 10,000 uh, pounds, 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds pre-approved. So they say there's a loan already there for you. All you have to do is take it out. So this is the prime example of how that money, that 50,000 pounds can be made in an account waiting for you, but it doesn't actually exist until you draw down that money engage in the contract, and then begin to make your interest payments on it. So that's an important aspect of how debt becomes an asset. But it's also what makes debt different than money. So money doesn't grow, right? You have money, uh, you have currency, it's fixed. But debt is interest-bearing capital, so it grows by definition. Now what's important to understand is that central banks don't actually control the amount of money that is created through debt deposits. Uh, there is no base reserves, there are no uh, ratios uh, for controlling how much money is made. It's done entirely by lenders with uh, a license to, to issue debt deposits. Uh, they control, the central bank controls the money supply only through interest rates, um, which is not much of a lever at all these days. Uh, and instead, when these debts are made by lenders, they just simply absorb. The central bank just simply expands its balance sheet. And that's important to understand when we internalize concepts like light touch regulation. So the central bank doesn't actually control the amount of debt it's created. It, what it does is adjust the interest rates between uh, the value of the debt that, that they make available to those who trade in the discount window. So again, LIBOR, so the lender in interbank bank rate is a private interest rate the Bank of England base rate is the interest rate between the central bank and the lending institutions. Okay, so it's important to understand that there is no one steering the ship. The banks are able to issue debt, uh, they're able to charge the interest that they deem uh, appropriate on whatever loan product, and they have a legally enforceable right to um, enforce that debt contract. So that is an incredible amount of commercial power that is given to one particular group of institutions within the economy. Um, this is the beginning of what is the, what becomes the, then the chain that then circulates of debt contracts through the global system. So this is the originate and distribute mon model. Banks issue loans, in doing so, they create de uh, debt deposits, they make assets on their balance sheet, but then they take that legal claim to those interest payments and then they circulate it through the banking system 
through various different slicing and dicing of claims against the income that's paid on that debt. So it's really important to understand that this is a huge amount of commercial power, legal power, political power, in addition to a kind of economic monetary power. That's not really technically uh, talked about a lot when we just look at strict kind of monetary theories or theories of banking and how it exists in a context of a, of a broader economy. Now, when we get to the story of 2008, debt crisis and austerity, the debt story uh, is really the story of austerity. So how do you manage, how do you govern uh, the, the debt buildup that occurs because of the originate and distribute model and, and this kind of debt economy based on, on, on this huge growth of debt across all sectors, I would, I would add. Uh, and that is the kind of story of crisis and austerity. So I want to talk about austerity as a form of storytelling. So the, the graph on here is for the UK. Um, the, the red line is the net public sector debt and the, and the yellow line is just household sector debt. Um, I've excluded the corporate sector, that's in the McKinsey graph next to it. Uh, but just to show you a kind of clear example of how austerity is about economic storytelling. So this is a quote from David Cameron. Uh, We're in this mess because of too much debt. Too much government debt, too much corporate debt, too much personal debt. This is Labour's debt crisis. And it becomes clearer all the time that the scale of Britain's debts puts us in a much weaker position than other countries. Okay, so this is said in, in, in 2009. I don't know if you can see the graph, but out here. Okay, so we can see that from the, from the financial crisis, uh, the story of austerity is something of fiscal consolidation, of bringing us into surplus, of controlling the national debt is absolute fiction, okay? Uh, the story of austerity is about taking on more and more and more public debt as the rate of private debt uptake stalls because the wider crisis in the economy makes it so that households cannot take on more debt or they're not taking on more debt. So it's just the government beginning to borrow uh, instead, of, instead of households. So I think that this is a really important way of understanding the nature of austerity as a kind of act of governance of debt. It's trying to tell, you know, tell a different story about debt than, than the logic of its own actions. Um, now the next graph over here, can you see it in the back? Is it clear enough? But it's, the, it's from the McKinsey Global Debt Report. And this is showing uh, in constant dollars, uh, the kind of rate of leverage uh, or outstanding debt across the different sectors. So it's showing quite clearly that from 2007 to 2014 in constant dollars, uh, the financial sector engages, has a huge um, deleveraging. So they're holding less debt. But that is immediately taken up by the government who has starts from a, a lower position of leverage into a much higher one. So this is again, the, the, the government bailing out the banking sector. Now the household sector quite interestingly also goes through a deleveraging. As we can see here, they're not taking on any more debt. But it's important to understand that this also occurs because quantitative easing, which is the central bank uh, scrubbing clean the, the balance sheets um, of the banks and other lenders with, by taking fresh government bonds, again, all that borrowing, uh, giving them to the central bank to scrub the bank's balance sheets clean, actually does benefit, according to the Bank of England, uh, the top 5% of households benefited from this scheme. So they were able to kind of also deleverage uh, as it's shown on a global scale in the, in the McKinsey report. But what we need to understand then is that the process of governance of debt is really one that is the defining feature of the post-2008 period. An inability to recognize that something needs to be done about this stock of debt. And the proposals on the table aren't any that actually deal directly with how are we going to get rid of this mountain of debt that sits on top of the economy that is taking present day income all the while and paying it directly into uh, servicing this debt stock. So 
In the 2008 period, what we have is what begins with bank bailouts becomes the unquantified risk guarantee. So this is, in Europe, this is the bazooka option where, you know, anything will be done to protect uh, the euro. This is the, the Treasury issuing an unquantified guarantee uh, if there's going to be another bailout uh, of the UK banking system. But then you add on top of that uh, successive rounds of quantitative easing and artificially uh, low interest rates. And we begin to kind of understand that since the financial crisis, there has been a consolidation of financialization, not that deliberately prevents systemic reform. And what happens as a result uh, is what I have kind of in increasingly are developing this concept of financial melancholia, right? So this is what the debt stock is doing. So financial melancholia is not your run-of-the-mill Great Depression. So this is to kind of counteract the, the, or offer a new way of thinking about, are we in recession? Are we in depression? Is it a great recession? Is it another Great Depression? Uh, is recovery, the fledging recovery happening? I want to say, well, actually, it's none of those things. What we live in is a period of financial melancholia in which the temporal displacement of debt, so the temporal shift of buy now, pay later, becomes the organizing force of kind of e the economic outlook at the same time as there is a shifting moral economy of debt. Um, so with financial melancholia, we have again this basic principle of debt in which you buy now and you pay later. And I know that kind of sounds very simplistic, but when we imagine what the effects of that are uh, across the household sector and over time on the scale that we saw here, this huge buildup of, of, of debt, especially at the household level, we begin to understand how the long time horizons of debt create uh, a kind of outlook in which the economy is defined as, the whole entire future is defined as pa always paying for the past. So why this matters for debt cancellation is that we have to come to grips with the fact that when a debt contract is issued uh, and that money is created, uh, economic activity is registered in that quarter. So when you get your mortgage and you buy your house, that is registered in that quarter. When you get your car loan and you t drive your car off the lot, it's registered in that quarter. So the economic activity that debt generates is measured within the time period of when the debt is issued and when you spend it. What then happens to 5, 10, 25 years in the future is that uh, income is being taken in the present day to pay for the debt of activities that was registered already in the past. So what we have today is that households are still servicing this enormous debt stock that built up before the crisis. So in effect, what is continuing to drag the economy down is this concept of debt deflation, right? Every pound, euro, or, or dollar of, of present day money take taken to pay back debts that were taken on during the good times when everything was booming, long after the banks had been bailed out, long after all kinds of uh, experimental measures has, have, have been implemented, is really a huge drain and ultimately what is kind of creating a wider economic malaise. And what that means without any prospect of reform or change is that the entire future becomes colonized by a vision of just making it to the end of the month, just managing your incomings and outgoings um, in such a way that, that you can remain solvent. But this does not a recovery make, okay? Having a huge segments of the population uh, kind of living under the, the, the yoke of a kind of melancholia that sets in when you cannot, um, you cannot let go of the past. Right? So that's the kind of concept of melancholia that's different than depression, right? So depression is a kind of acute phase uh, in which you feel, you know, if we just take the psychological definition in which you feel powerless over your circumstances, uh, but it's not a kind of generalized phase. Melancholia is like a mourning for something that you feel you've lost, irre you know, irreversibly, but you can accept that it's gone, so you for are forever kind of uh, trying to revive a sense of control in your life. And I think that that's a better way of understanding the effects of debt than, for example, depressed investor confidence or um, stagnant consumer confidence. 
Because really what debt does, especially at the, the, the household level, is that it, it requires uh, a great deal of management. And I'll get onto that in a minute about caring for debts. But um, when you're trying to imagine a time horizon of staying solvent, so maybe I'll pay off my debts in 10 years or 15 years, the time horizons are so far in the future that it stifles any sort of uh, revitalization in the present. And more importantly, financial melancholia tries to make space for the real social, uh, psychological, cultural effects that debt has within society. So debt, for example, is the leading cause family pro uh, of family breakdown. Uh, so financial trouble, insolvency, potential bankruptcy, house problem. This, this is actually causing uh, family breakdown, um, suicide, uh, you know, social unrest as a result of, of indebtedness. These are all things that have been kind of qualitatively and, and uh, measured in many different kind of studies. So I want to propose that it's by recognizing both the economic effects of debt and their kind of sociocultural effects, we, we can begin to understand that debt cancellation is a form of relief. It is a reform of relief from always more of the same, of a future that is entirely colonized by exactly the type of activity that's, uh, that households try to make every month. So the kind of moral aspects of debt that, that financial melancholia tries to unpack as well not just the kind of temporal dynamics, is really that there is a kind of moral economy lens that governs debt, uh, which really is about the kind of main economic institutions um, kind of creating norms that define the rights and responsibilities of debtors and lenders. But how these norms are kind of legitimated are kind of through the moral behavior of central bankers, of the Troika, um, and you know of the kind of British Bankers Association and the American Bankers Association, these trade bodies. So what's happened is we have this kind of elite technocratic governance structure that is managing uh, the global financial system and, and, and national debt stocks using quite you know moralistic lenses around whose debts should be repaid and whose bad debts should be cancelled. Uh, and that really kind of and we saw it probably most clearly in Greece, in which you have this, uh, you know, effective bailout of, of of the banks using kind of government money, and then it's the the government that must impose austerity. The people reject austerity, but it's still imposed anyway. So the idea that um, the Greek people must pay the debts that the banks couldn't pay is is again the kind of shifting moralism that many people quite rightly recognize at face value as being unethical. So what happens when you bail out banks and then enforce austerity is that you kind of uh, you expose this really problematic problematic aspect of the kind of moral sanctity of you must repay your debts, when clearly this is only enforced on some de debt contracts for some actors some of the time, and it is through that kind of moral lens that we really begin to see the power relations between creditors and debtors in the era of financialization and which debt is being governed. So what I want to point out is that the problem with the debt stock is that it has to be cared for, okay? And it has to be, so this is the kind of UK outstanding debts, US outstanding debts. You can see they follow a very similar trajectory, mortgage, consumer debt, everything's on a rocket upward. Uh, the reasons for this are so, somewhat well established, stagnating wage growth, uh, privatized, uh, you know, the kind of debt safety nets. Uh, education loans. I mean, they're, everyone knows probably by looking in their own wallet and at their own financial statements how all this debt gets amassed. There's more debt for everyone. Um, obviously, it's how money is being um, generated in the economy. But this debt stock sits atop, in a kind of metaphorical way, the household sector, and it must be cared for. It must be managed through um, the household budget sheet, incomings and outgoings through cash flow. So it's the prioritizing of some debts over others. It's the prioritizing of debt over in savings or the prioritizing of debt over investment or consumption needs. It's how debt becomes a centralized preemptory claim against household income. But importantly, and the research that I've just finished doing looks at how debt is not 
managed by one borrower with one lender or one borrower with multiple lenders. Actually, debt is managed at the household level. Debt is managed within a household and across households as a series of competing claims uh, against what is usually a, a fairly fixed, if not unstable source of, of household income. So you need to only look at the kind of segmentation within the labor market to understand that if you're getting a regular salary, you're still living in a cost of living crisis, but you're trying to manage that salary against mounting debt obligations. But if you live, but if you have a temporary or contract work, if you're a small and medium sized business, how you're managing to stay solvent is really an act that is done at the household level through uh, both paid and unpaid work, through care obligations, uh, through relationships of care and responsibility, of obligation and responsibility across the household. So therefore, it really matters uh, what type of household you come from, right? So debts are not uh, universally bad or good. Instead, they are kind of mediated through class, gender, race, but as well as space and time. Uh, so it matters whether you have a mortgage loan in Southeast England or Northeast England, for example. Right? So how much debt you have, you can have a much bigger mortgage in the southeast of England, uh, but you would have access to a more vibrant labor market, you might have access to real wage gains. If you have a much smaller mortgage in the northeast of England, uh, that geography matters. Uh, you don't have a buoyant employment market, you're likely to have declining real incomes. So it might be a smaller amount of debt, but it's actually um, the kind of income what kind of income, what kind of job you have access to. Also, you know, are you a dual income family? Are you a single mother with children? Are you retired, right? Are you exited the labor market? Are you a student? These kind of, the composition of the household matters in terms of how debt is cared for and what its effects are on the, on the wider economy. So I want to introduce the idea of debt jubilee uh, well, I don't want to introduce it, it's an old idea. <laughs> Lots of people talk about it. But I want to take up the idea of debt jubilee as something that we can revive in the contemporary context, uh, drawing on all of these kind of uh, different books and, and literature uh, to kind of think through what would this mean in the context of Anglo-American financialization of debt, crisis, and austerity. What would a debt jubilee uh, today look like? Or what, or what are some different possibilities for for achieving it. Um, and I just, you know, there are just so many examples of debt cancellation that I, I kind of want to point out that especially with the rise of populism, uh, I want to point out that, you know, the right wing kind of populist movement, I have no doubt will make it right with debt cancellation. I have no doubt that the sanctity of you must repay your debts is, is can easily be renegotiated. Uh, if it's to meet particular ends. Uh, and we have this example you know, in history. We can have a quite organized uh, massive default like uh, the end of the Bretton Woods, you know, when the US promised to give you uh, gold for uh, greenbacks, or would promise to give you uh, gold and instead gave you greenbacks. Uh, you know, that was a huge debt default, but uh, the economy went on, we accepted it and, and, and changed. Or we can have, uh, you know, the Debt Jubilee 2000, the Highly Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, in which it's negotiated piecemeal and only for the kind of most uh, odious debts. Uh, we can have a Weimar Republic style of just tearing up the debt contracts. You know, they, they can be done in many different ways in many different political contexts. So really, the this is where I come to a kind of pragmatism in which we need to see this as, as solving problems and building into a, a different political movement that captures a, a, a different economic imaginary rather than allowing uh, the political movements on the rise to beat us to the punch, uh, as it were. So one of the proposals is for a kind of basic debt restructuring. Um, so this is, uh, I use here the symbol that I love from the, the, the debt resistance manual that came out, You Are Not Alone. Uh, I thought that that was probably the best capturing of my research done by somebody I've never met in my life, <laughs> but uh, pretty much sums it up, which is really about um, restructuring the, the household debt stock through a kind of 
range of different means, but really that begins with a kind of household financial assessment. So if anybody's ever been, household financial assessment, by the way, is a very standard um, practice. You want to go to a personal uh, financial advisor, they're going to give you a household financial assessment. You want to go to step change, you get a personal financial assessment. You want to get a mortgage, you have to fill out a personal financial assessment. The tracking of incomings and outgoings in an era of digitalized banking means that it's quite easy to get a very quick assessment of how much uh, debt a household owes, how much income a household has access to, and what is the debt burden. So we can begin with quite simple techniques that already exist. But really, this is about kind of looking at debt restructuring as a way of picking different uh, paths to ultimately reducing the debt stock that fit each national context. So there's not a one-size-fits-all approach here. Because debt exists in a national regulatory framework, and we, when we look at forms of debt, uh, of debt resistance uh, uh, work, within like Southern Europe, for example, uh, we can see that the legal frameworks of debt actually matter in terms of how we can go about restructuring debt. But it's important, this quote, by the way, a write down of debt on this scale would normally lead to an awful lot of pain, losing homes. This is actually from the IMF. I probably should have attributed that properly. But the IMF actually did a working paper that uh, really kind of made the case that we should have household debt forgiveness simply because it would allow for a kind of, uh, to prevent a really bad uh, mass scale restructuring, the government should absorb some of those costs and, and, and implement household, um, what is it, LTRO uh, process. So how would we do this? Well, this is really about making cheap credit a public good. So if we imagine that we live right now in a time of negative real interest rates for, for the big institutional lenders. But rather than try to wrap your mind around what that might actually mean, let's just take the base rate. So if you want to borrow 50 million pounds, you'll pay maybe, if it depends on what kind of borrower you are, just under 1% interest on 50 billion. Not much more than that. Credit is cheap. If you're a good institutional borrower, you'll get it cheap. You want to borrow 50 pounds on the high street, you'll pay what? 1,500%? 1,200% at the payday loan? Your overdraft will cost you 38 to 48% plus charges and fees if you want to calculate that. That's for 50 pounds. So 50 billion pounds you can get for next to nothing over the long term. But small amounts of credit, the type of credit that households borrow at, is much more expensive, okay? Because the household sector is the kind of feedstock uh, for, the, for the debt economy. So what debt restructuring would mean and household assessment, part of that would be a simple debt swap. To say that households need to be able to access credit at the same cheap rate as everyone else. So you swap high cost fringe finance products with low cost credit. All right. So this is to kind of prevent a sub, you know, the subprime uh, insolvency uh, debacle in which very small scale mortgages were charging really high rates of interest, leading to high default rates, which then uh, set off all kinds of benchmark indicators and led to a valuation problem. So if we, instead of allowing, uh, continuing to set off the, you know, alarm bells within the financial system, instead we begin to take household sector debt and restructure it so that credit becomes a public good. Cheap credit flows uh, to all the sectors of the economy equally. Uh, another way of making credit a public good is to kind of eliminate uh, the tax breaks that are given to the selling on of distressed debt. So a key aspect of how non-performing loans are dealt with is that they're allowed to be kind of wholesale moved off the bank, uh, off the uh, balance sheets of lenders. And lenders get a tax break for, for, for their non-performing assets. Uh, that's a loss on their balance sheet. They get a tax break for it. What happens then is they sell the debts on secondary markets. So has anyone here heard of the Rolling Jubilee that they did? Yeah? So OK, a few people. So Rolling Jubilee was um, something they started a, a, out of Occupy Wall Street in the, in the US, in which uh, they pooled together money, bought 
these debts that were bought on secondary markets, discharged debts, and forgave um, the debts of, of, of people who had been chased by debt collectors. So what eliminating the tax break would do is we could say, well, uh, and it just normalizes a process that the finance con financial conduct authority in this country and uh, in the U.S. they do with Wells Fargo, for example, in which they're making one-off settlements for for borrowers. You just make this on a mass scale. So basically, you say to lenders, if you cancel the debt, you get a tax break. If you sell it on, you get nothing. Uh, so you incentivize the banks rather than to sell their debts for uh, 10p uh, on the pound or five cents on the dollar. You tell them you sell that, you cancel the debt, you get the tax break, you sell it on, you get nothing. Uh, so that we can eliminate this practice of that pushes people into insolvency of kind of buying and selling um, debt contracts that have already been written off. So these are kind of this is what I mean. These are kind of pragmatic, simple policy-based solutions of different paths to implementing debt restructuring. But ultimately, there will be a kind of level of, so there's write down, there's restructure write down, but then there's write off. So that is just canceling debts. Uh, how this would work in the property market would could be something like, um, if you're over leveraged on your mortgage and you accept some level of debt cancellation, you will then be taxed when your house is sold uh, to pay that back. So you can't have your debt canceled and then sell your house and, and keep all the asset value increase. So you could do things like debt cancellation, contingent debt cancellation, or you can do like what they did with Wonga loans or Wells Fargo's loans. You just cancel a whole loan book if it's deemed to be fraudulently obtained, uh, if people's interest rates were changed without uh, permission, you could also just have wholesale debt cancellation for various different products uh, on various different conditions. But if we took it together, restructuring down to lower interest rates, um, writing it down uh, on different products, and then canceling, uh, or even just canceling debt because the household is on the verge of insolvency, right? So rather than tipping them into the point of insolvency, um, you cancel the debts. You could speed up the bankruptcy process, for example. That could be another way. Some countries like Ireland, you know, before 2008, Ireland didn't even have a bankruptcy law. You, you were just uh, chased forever <laughs> for your debts. Uh, in the UK, for example, we have uh, full recourse mortgages. That means that if your property sells for less than the value of your mortgage, the bank can pursue you until you die for the outstanding amount. It doesn't matter that the property is sold. There's no downside risk for the lender in that respect. I mean, it costs the money to chase you up, but they can still make that claim against you. So debt cancellation can be a way of, of creating that sharing, risk sharing, I think is the, the word they like to use at the central bank, risk sharing arrangements. But ultimately the goal is not really to let the banks off the hook, but rather to let the lenders off the, or the borrowers off the hook by saying that, listen, the good times are over. We've, we had our day, let's stop paying for uh, debts that are 10 or 15 years old, that are, you know, that the payment of them are, are draining present day economic uh, activity, present day household solvency and, and well being, and, and cancel the debt. So, the reason um, I want to make these claims again is for this kind of to change the, the future um, oriented kind of uh, perspective on. Uh, alternative economic futures. For me, I just felt like the only way I could com combat what started with the Brexit vote and the, and the uncertainty that that brought about then was compounded hugely <laughs> with uh, Trump being elected president was that I had to start working towards something that I thought could reignite an imagination of a future that might be better than today, uh, a, a kind of imaginary that doesn't leave kind of all radical experiments to the central bank. You know, so when they start talking about, uh, you know, oh, quantitative easing is really radical experimental policy. You know, will the, the central bank have digital transfers to households? Ooh, look at this. And I thought, you know, if all the radical thinking is coming out of the central bank, then I'm not doing my job <laughs> because I need something more than that. I don't think leaving debt governance to technocrats is, um, 
is really enough anymore. I think we have to start uh, using concepts like um, guaranteed minimum income, uh, citizens' dividend, debt cancellation, um, you know, doing something about climate change. You know, these kind of big, big existential problems that the world faces. I look at the political leadership and I see nothing being done. So this argument, this kind of pragmatic case for, for, for debt cancellation is really about saying, well, listen, we can put some proposals on the table. We can debate, we can discuss, we can disagree. Uh, but ultimately, this is one way that we can begin to work together to imagine a different future. And that's really about, you know, changing the kind of flawed moral economy of financialization in general, but neoliberalism that says, uh, you know, you're responsible for your future, uh, all the risk is yours, you're the great entrepreneurial self, here's your loan, uh, make the best out of your life. Uh, and then when everything goes wrong, there is a blank check bazooka option given to everybody that brought us into this mess. You know, I think we really need to begin to challenge that moral economy head on uh, by saying, well, we can, we can make things better. Um, because ultimately, what the bailout showed was that banks can't go bankrupt anymore. Uh, corporations don't go bankrupt anymore. Uh, if that's the case, why are households allowed to go bankrupt? Um, or if they are allowed to go bankrupt, why is it such a bad thing? Why can't we have more bankruptcy more often, right? So there's many different ways we can go down this path that really is about uh, exploring what a, a kind of more egalitarian or, or socially just moral economy would look like. So it's about kind of changing the direction of travel. Uh, and some of the examples I kind of look to when I, when I think about this future is things like debt audits, uh, like the one in Greece, like the ones they do in Spain. Uh, I'll be done a lot sooner. <laughs> um, but also the kind of debt audits that uh, I found in my research uh, that, that individuals are doing. So, you know, there's, there's this kind of movement now towards these sort of debt-free living, debt-free journeys, you know, small groups of, of debtors coming together to try to repair their balance sheet, engaged in a kind of personal austerity of deleveraging. You know, these groups are coming together to say, you know, debt is actually causing real problems in my household, in my, in my life. I don't want to live in debt anymore. I want debt freedom. And, and working together to, to try to imagine a future in which they're not living under the yoke of, of, of making their interest payments. Uh, but also a kind of more public act of asking, what is this great public debt we're all meant to be, uh, con you know, tightening our belts to, to achieve? Uh, why is it that my belt has to be tightened again? And, 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 you know, really looking at the kind of auditing of debts, both personal at the community level, at the national level, as a kind of democratic tool to, again, bring these more technocratic solutions into a, a broader, uh, sorry, broader political and, and social conversation about what, what the future holds. Because as of today, I don't think anybody can really say what that will be. So I want to take that moment to begin to start to think about a new imaginary. So I do that basically by asking this question about everything I know about debt is that it is created as easily as a stroke of a keyboard, right? So as long as, you know, and, and even the paperwork, I, used, I always used to say, as long as your paperwork is in order, you can get a loan. But then it turns out with the Wells Fargo uh, scandal in the US and, and the motor line debt cancellation in the UK, it turns out that not even that's true. You can get a loan without any paperwork or without the paperwork being in order at all. So it really is that debt can be created as easily as just pressing enter on a keyboard. And if that's the case, then why can't debt disappear that easily? If it's really that simple, uh, and that's the kind of the way I'm coming, approaching it. Um, so when we look at the other kind of proposals that are on the table about um, how we can, what is the future? One is towards a kind of fiscal stimulus uh, directed at households. So this is like debt cancellation will work alongside these other proposals. Now, this is the argument that we need wages to grow. We need wage-led growth. Uh, we need to inflate the debt away. That's the kind of term. But the problem is, for me, is that that is 20 years in the future. Even if we begin with, no, okay, no more uh, negative real wages, let's pump 
uh, wage-like growth into the system, allow uh, incomes to rise, and then that will pay down the debt. It will happen so far in the future that it doesn't actually cure the financial melancholia that has colonized our future. Um, it's not a bad idea, it's just, and it would have to work together with immediate debt cancellation. The other one is QE for the people. This is direct monetary stimulus for households. The idea of rather than directing uh, quantitative easing towards the bank, we direct it to the household sector. And I think there is a, a, some potential uh, for that, although it's still not clear how it would work when uh, the central bank says it only buys assets, it doesn't buy debt. Um, what is the assets they would be buying? How would it be done? I think it's an interesting question, and certainly debt cancellation could be part, work together with a form of quantitative easing for the people. Um, but I think what's most kind of interesting to think about proposals like QE for the people is really that in 2008, things like this were unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. Uh, that we would have something like QE for the people, helicopter money uh, was laughed at, that we would have, that, that politicians would be talking about a fiscal stimulus and, and, a, and, and promoting wage-led growth. I mean, I was listening to Radio 4 uh, the other day and a guy from, um, I want to say, he, he was from a big consultancy firm, maybe Capgemini or something, actually got on the radio and said, listen, why are we being blamed for the failure of globalization and austerity? In the end, uh, stagnating wages has to, do about, has to do with unionization, and that's up to the national government. If people just organized in unions, wages would go up. I was like, hey, the guy from Cap Gemini said that. You know, so again, how is it the case that you know, this is the ideas that are being floated around that even in 2008 would have been un unthinkable? Nobody would have said, let wages increase, let, you know, uh, <laughs> let alone someone from Cap Gemini. Um, and I think that that's interesting. Now is the moment. It is this uncertainty. It is, it, it is the way in which um, we have to kind of combat fear with, with a different vision, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have. Merry crisis and happy new fear. Um, <laughs> I'm told I can be a bit of a downer, so I've tried to lighten up the presentation a bit. Uh, and you can kind of see the, some of the other stuff that's written with, by myself and other colleagues, you know, trying to talk about alternative economic futures, financial melancholia and indebtedness uh, here uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, uh, I open up the floor now, so I'd love to get your comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonah. Um, ben, can I hand over to you for five to ten minutes to offer some reflections on that presentation for us? Okay, well, thanks for that excellent presentation, and I always find your work very challenging as well as theoretically and empirically informed with an eye to improving the lives of those who, particularly at the rough end of contemporary capitalism. By chance, I uh, came across a quote from George Orwell's Animal Farm this morning, uh, to which I've added one word at the beginning, financial. Financial man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk, he does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow, he cannot run fast enough to catch rabbits. Yet he is lord of all the animals. He sets them to work, he gives them back to them the bare minimum that will prevent them from starving, and the rest he keeps for himself. I think this is quite an appropriate, I mean, it's very lucky that I came across it for Jana's presentation, and to some extent uh, reflects uh, her approach analytically and theoretically. She shared her synopsis for the book with me, and uh, what I gleaned out of there is that a position in which finance is seen as taking from poor people and, in doing so, traps itself in continuing recession, to which, paradoxically and perversely, the policy response is austerity, which merely makes things even worse. This might reflect a deeper theoretical stance or general stance that wages are too low to sustain the capitalist economy and that historically this currently takes the form of household 
indebtedness. Now, this position, if, if, that, if I'm getting it correct, uh, brings together two traditions over both of which I am very skeptical. The first is underconsumptionist, in the sense that the reason we're in the trouble we are is because wages are too low. And second, secondly, that what might be called secondary exploitation by finance is one of the mechanisms for bringing this about. I don't want to dwell on these, I just want to say that I have my doubts about them and about their relation to explaining and remedying the crisis. The one thing I do want to do, and I've done this before, is to raise the question over the empirical weight of the sorts of household indebtedness that we're talking about in terms of its explanation for contemporary capitalism, especially if we move beyond the United States, and especially given that the heaviest indebted households, in fact, you refer to this in terms of the north-south divide in this country, are the wealthiest, uh, both within and between countries. In fact, they're the ones with the large mortgages, like me. Um, However, what Jana does do is to target the poor and imagines an army of officials and a host of procedures to sort out uh, debt cancellation for those who are worthy of this. That is the relatively worse off, not the heavily mortgaged and uh, uh, rich homeowners. A little bit tongue-in-cheek. I want to suggest we already have this, and indeed, Jana referred to it, in partial and diluted forms. Uh, three ways, one of which has actually only come about a couple of weeks ago. One is bankruptcy. That's one way of debt cancelling. By the way, if you get into debt, declare bankruptcy. Make it very hard for them to collect interest and they'll leave you alone. The second is social security. Social security is a form of... Uh, providing for those who are unable to otherwise provide for themselves. And the third one, the new one, which again I just came across by chance, is Goldman Sachs. I've lost it now. Uh, Goldman Sachs has suddenly entered into the business of personal loans from $3,500 to $30,000 for terms of up to six years at average rates of interest 12 to 13% below credit card rates. So... Here we have actually, still at a rate of interest, some degree of debt, not quite cancellation, but Goldman Sachs, who's never had anything to do with consumer credit before, suddenly entering in a massive way and in a massive campaign, as it were, to uh, relieve you of your uh, major debt burdens. There is also the question, and this comes back to what happened in Animal Farm, uh, actually humans, men, were, take, were replaced by pigs who did exactly the same thing. If you have your debt cancelled, the first thing you're going to do is use that as collateral to get another debt. So the question is whether we're going to recreate the same society that we've uh, tried to get rid of, however temporarily. More significantly, I think, um, is, and I'm to some extent puzzled by this, uh, because you've rounded up uh, debt cancellation for countries and so on with that of households, this seems to be a, a circuitous and particular and select form of a very different sort of policy. Well, perhaps not that different. And that is big, basic income grant. So why not go for that, which has certain strategic advantages in terms of possibly more readily mobilizing those for a basic income grant, more appeal, and probably more practicality insofar as it doesn't seem to involve all of the uh, household assessments that you uh, seem, would seem, see as necessary to get hit the worthy of debt cancellation. Now, I personally am very skeptical about big as well. Uh, but that doesn't mean I oppose big as such or any measure, including those of debt cancellation, uh, that will alleviate the impoverished, including debt uh, relief. But I would tend to go for other strategies, uh, 
for political, ideological, and possibly practical reasons as well. And those are strategies of direct provision, job creation and direction, if not appropriation of finance towards providing jobs, services, and so on, uh, which would appear to me to be more effective in current conditions and provide greater potential for both mobilization and transformation within and out of neoliberalism. One million, very popular one, seems to have gone off the uh, skyline for the moment. One million jobs for climate change uh, within Britain, for example. And I also think this takes away the stigma, or shall we call it melancholia, attached to indebtedness, which may persist with the micro-assessed, rather than be relieved, with the micro-assessed debt relief that you're uh, suggesting, which is very much like uh, social security in some, 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 some sense. So without fundamental transformations, which you begin to embrace, but without fundamental transformations other than in the area of the indebtedness of the, of the poorest, it will be the case possibly that financial man will reappear with pigs in his place. Thank you More so much. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to take a few minutes to respond to that before we open to the floor? Yeah, sure. Well, those were um, excellent, excellent comments. So I think um, one of the points I should make uh, more clear is about the connection between debt and wealth. So I'm trying to say that debt and wealth are actually not separate entities, but debt is wealth in many respects, which is exactly to Ben's point that the most indebted are the most wealthy because debt and wealth have a particular connection uh, under financialization, which is that, again, uh, who owns the claims on debt, who's getting the, the fees and the, the bonuses associated with the spread of debt, uh, within society, but also how debt is effectively an asset class and debt is intimately linked to the kind of rise of different forms of asset classes in financialization. So if we imagine that debt and wealth are actually the same, like flip sides of the same coin, I don't want to use Keith's Hart's <laughs> famous metaphor, but you see where I'm going. These are very intimately linked in a way. Debt is not... Uh, just a kind of a, a, a mechanism or, or a, a form of accessing wealth. Debt is a form of wealth. And having debt is also an indicator of how much wealth you have or can amass. So precisely because you can get a big mortgage and the value of your house will go up higher and higher, you then have the paper value to then borrow more against it. But what that means is that because of that connection between um, debt and wealth and in the sense that uh, debt cancellation actually allows for, uh, which I'll get to your point about those that are worthy, but actually means that the effects of debt cancellation will be highly concentrated within uh, the wealthiest households. They will effectively be hurt most by debt cancellation. But I think what I would say there is that this is a trade-off, right? We are going to have to relieve the debts of those, and I wouldn't say the poor. I mean, I'm talking more like the 75th percentile down, the 80th percentile down, would be was who I would target, much broader kind of uh, element of the household sector. Um, but their, what they gain through debt cancellation will be paid through the destruction of the wealth claims of uh, those much higher up the income distribution, sort of 0.5% of wealth holders. So in that respect, um, you, do, you kind of spread the benefits widely across society, but those left holding the bag are very concentrated at the top. Some might see it as a good thing, but that's also what makes debt cancellation politically totally unpalatable because it's the wealthiest households that are sort of in charge uh, at very least. Um, so I think that in that respect, um, the connection between debt and wealth is one I completely agree with and it probably needs to be better unpacked uh, as the book progresses. Now, I think the concept of like those that are worthy 
is not exactly, because again, it's precisely challenging that moral economy between good credit. Like credit is good, but debt is bad. So we, we saw this, you know, on a global scale in the 90s through the kind of debt jubilee campaign in which the global north was the great creditor nations of the world and the global south were the kind of debtor nations and we needed some sort of moral justice of debt forgiveness. Uh, you know, the way that it was sort of played up that, you know, in, through that language. Not even, what, 10, what was it, 10 or 15 years later that we have Greece, you know, again, right inside Europe saying no debt cancellation, no forgiveness, austerity pay. Uh, we begin to see that there is no shifting now in the sense that we can say these are the, you know, these are the creditor nations. So what, China, the great creditor nation or the, the Gulf states? You know, China has its own debt problems, right? It's not a case that they are lending, you know, money is being generated by lenders, by the, the, the people who have the ability to issue debt contracts. So the idea of kind of credit is good, but debt is bad is precisely the kind of moral framing that I'm trying to un, uh, do away with, rather to see it as a form of provisioning, credit as a form of, like you say, direct provisioning. So, um, but I like the question, and you're probably right, uh, about do you just, does this just reproduce the system? Does, do you just take your debt cancellation and then consume wildly and, and still exploit the planet? And, or do you take it and just borrow more, um, use it as collateral for more loans? Although I don't think you really need much collateral for a loan these days, I'd point out. But um, uh, you just need a, a, a pay stub, if that. Um, that's an interesting question. And I think that, that it, there is definitely a possibility that debt cancellation will do nothing to revitalize a kind of future, a different future. It could just provide a kind of nice little technical fix for the present. I do believe that that is why debt cancellation will increasingly be taken up at a technocratic level to kind of provide a kind of band-aid fix to the problem. So I'm trying to imagine it as part of something that works with a basic income. So not instead of a basic income. What I'm saying is that the basic income or a basic income grant or citizen's dividend, no matter what, will be something that could only decrease debt over the long term, decades even, because it would have to be first implemented, parsed out, and you would still have to do a household assessment anyway to have access to a kind of basic income. You would still have to register, you'd still have to kind of provide that kind of uh, details. So I'm just saying, and again, I think of the household assessment as something that's a little bit more empowering than a kind of bean counting exercise to determine whether you're worthy or not. I see it more as like people, and that's my, again, my empirical research with debtors is more that people feel so alienated from their own finances. Money goes in electronically. They don't even send you a pay slip in it. It like goes in electronically. Your bills come out electronically. You can just sort of go ages without even looking. All you're looking is to see is if you're an overdraft, right? You're just trying to, it's ticking over. People feel very distanced from their own, um, their own financial state, right? There's no home economics anymore. There's no oikonoima in which you're sort of managing the household. You're just sort of told, go out there, work, consume, uh, and, 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 you know, if, if only a good financial citizen sort of gets software to do it. Instead, I want to kind of imagine the household assessment as a way in which people would, um, I guess, I don't know what would be the parallel, but would be, I would see it as a more empowering tool than, than just to be assessed and then, um, you know, passed on to kind of a series of procedures. But you're right, though, that is exactly how it would have to be in practice. So I think that the, the fundamental question that you raise that I, I don't have an answer for, but I need to work out is whether you'd have to be worthy and what would the conditions of that be? Uh, because I wouldn't, I would want to change the framing of that, but also what is the radical potential if debt cancellation just becomes a mechanism for um, fixing a broken system? And, and, I, and that's why I would like to see it as part of something of a, of a wider program of direct provisioning is how I would answer that. Fantastic. Well, shall we see who has some questions from the floor? Take a few together. Yep. Many? Yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. I wonder how the 
There's a question here. two on housing um yeah so the i mean dealing with housing and, and debt cancellation around housing is uh again is a kind of tricky business because uh it depends on the kind of context it would be a real uh, national context issue because you're right in the U u.s they have non-recourse mortgages so you can just leave your keys on the when you can't make payments anymore you leave your keys on the on the uh, in the house and you walk away and it's the bank has to accept the risk that uh, you can't uh, make your payments and and that is precisely why they had such a sharp um, contraction the property uh, market and and the banks had all kinds of problems whereas in the UK because we have full recourse mortgages households still continue to even if they're underwater in their homes uh, even if they can't make payments they they really um, understand that if they sell their house for less than the value of their mortgage, there are still people pursue, being pursued for endowment mortgage uh, that they walked away from in the 90s. So that kind of fear actually is pr precisely the kind of psychological effects that debt has that exists in different contexts, but it's also why the UK didn't, even though it had such a substantial property bubble as well, didn't go down the same route as the US, which was sharp contraction and then... Um, begin to try to uh, claw back some of the, um, you know, price increases as if that was a good thing. So I think the idea around housing provisioning and the state getting back into the direct provision of housing, housing isn't really important aspect, like you rightly point out, about what would need to happen in order to prevent this kind of housing-based welfare, right? So instead of actually relying on your house being your pension, 
why don't you provide an actual pension or why don't you provide housing for pensioners? Um, because this is precisely the problem is that um, housing wealth has become the, you know, people's pension savings uh, as the kind of demographic, you know, the supposed demographic bomb has meant that uh, state pension provision hasn't been high enough. But ultimately, this is a one shot deal. We don't have the type of, and this is intergenerational quality, we don't have the ability of one generation to use their house as a pension, sell their house at a huge markup, take that one-off windfall of money uh, to live off for the rest of their life. That can only happen for one generation because what we found uh, that's happening across Europe and in particular in the UK is that those people who had access to cheap and affordable housing in the 90s, um, interest rates that were going down, but property values that were going up, like then, <laughs> uh, is that, you know, effectively you have people that were um, buying houses uh, cheap, the, the value was only going up, interest rates were only going down, incomes were still buoyant. They want to sell that uh, house to uh, a younger generation of people who have unstable unemployment, real wage declines, at a substantial markup. Those people will not earn enough in their lifetime to expect a 200% increase in their uh, property value or whatever it is that the average kind of household enjoyed in, in Britain. It's a one-time deal. It's a one-off uh, generational uh, windfall for those that were born at the right time. Uh, so the issue about, sorry, did, that, did I lose you there? <laughs> So basically what it is, is that in the 90s, in particular, yeah, people got cheap housing. So we can only cancel the debt of those that are highly leveraged uh, now. That doesn't, again, to Ben's point, doesn't prevent another property bubble from forming if we still rely on housing wealth as the primary financial asset that all households own, right? So if all households' main financial asset is their home and that is their main pension savings, uh, then we will continue to stoke property bubbles because that's how every individual household will provide for their old age. But if instead we have government provisioning of housing, government provisioning for, for those who exit the labor market, we begin to then uh, eliminate all of the driving forces towards housing and, and debt-based housing. So again, debt cancellation in and of itself alone would not address the issue in the long term of fundamentally reforming the housing bubble, but it will it would in conjunction with other measures. Um, what I think I would say though is that it is an important measure for though especially for those people um, who are struggling to get on the housing market or entered the housing market in the past what five to seven years when you know highly leveraged. Uh, we need to eliminate some of that debt to make uh, the the outstanding mortgages on on that housing more affordable and more manageable, which isn't exactly debt cancellation, but it's certainly restructuring. Um, now for the question about, um, oh yeah, debt to GDP ratios uh, and the kind of different picture. I mean, that's exactly right. It's just that I, I don't use that measure because I'm trying to talk about household level provisioning rather than the entire value of household debt to the whole entire economy and, and the value added in the economy because um, I, I'm trying to show that it is the household sector that must provision, you know, must provide the necessary income and management of that debt stock. And these are also the workers and the consumers uh, and the carers and the kind of providers of uh, the, you know, the reproduction of the economy has to also sort of reproduce these debts and, and manage them. So I, that's why I don't use that measure. But you're absolutely right that even if we look at debt to GDP ratios or even, you know, debt to household income ratios, I mean, the funny thing is that the US and UK aren't even the worst. The worst is, is the Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark. But what makes these countries different than the Anglo-American countries is that these are countries that have direct social provisioning by the government. These have highly elaborate welfare states uh, that, 
so that households don't mind being highly leveraged because they know they'll have a pension, they know they'll they'll never be homeless, right? So it's that kind of psychological, social, sociological phenomenon of living in a kind of Anglo-liberal uh, country that, that really does make, uh, you know, it's not the absolute level of debt, it's what the debt is doing, regardless of its level, to the, to the economy that is a problem. Um, but yeah, being realistic about how um, how possible debt cancellation is is a huge issue. I mean, that's the rub for me, right? Is that well, we can have literally billions and billions of pounds, you know, approved regularly to extend quantitative easing to 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 use government debt to pass it on to scrub the balance sheets of the bank clean without question without accountability i mean the the new one i'm trying to work on is can we make quantitative easing at least as onerous as social impact bonds so you know you can kind of apply for quantitative easing as an institution if you kind of meet the same benchmarks that they laid out for social impact bonds i mean that would be something of a parody but it's totally unrealistic because there's no question that quantitative easing will be renewed again or that it will continue in some way, shape or form um, because that is about uh, providing for the banks, which goes to your point about why can't we just let the banks go bankrupt? And if we lived in a world where when banks went bankrupt, your debt contracts were cancelled, then yes. But actually what happens is the bank goes bankrupt, the outstanding debts are assets that are then sold off to the creditors of the bank. So it would do nothing for the borrowers themselves if a bank went bankrupt. They would just pass that debt on to another solvent lender, which is what happened uh, in the UK with Northern Rock. I mean, nobody who had a Northern Rock mortgage got a break on it. They just said, oh, don't worry, keep making your payments, you'll just make it to someone else. So I think that that's the kind of dynamic. Uh, I'm trying to more say, well, if banks can't go bankrupt anymore, <laughs> then we need to begin to fundamentally rethink the morality of bankruptcy. And I do think that the great thing about bankruptcy is that it does sort of draw a line under boom and bust, right? I mean, it just creates a limit to, uh, and draws a line to say, you know, we're done now. Uh, we have to, in some way, reset, right? We have to start from a different position, you know, which is the point of debt jubilee to begin with. Um, and I think that that is really the appeal, right? When we live in a time of such uncertainty, of, of so much fluctuation, uh, the, the idea that we could somehow draw some line under it to say, okay, the past is the past, let's work towards a different future. I think in this climate, it has more traction than it would have even five years ago or even three years ago. And it's about, you know, building that political argument because ultimately, you know, there is still a, a realistic argument about why it's a good thing. There's cost benefits. We just need to push hard for it, I guess, rather than imagine that the capitalist will accept it based purely on its logic and merit to fight like hell to get it. Yeah. Absolutely. And debt cancellation is a way of saying, well, if you do everything, anything you want, so can we, <laughs> so, you know, uh, if that makes flippant sense. Alfredo, you had a question? Let's kind of explore a little bit the, the argument that you're making. I can see how uh, this debt jubilee would improve the financial situation of households. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah. I'm not good at predictions, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Well, I think this kind of fits in ni nicely with kind of Ben's point about, you know, do we just, repl do we just, does debt cancellation just provide a kind of, does anything new come of it or, or is it just implementing the same system again? Um, so in terms of what happens to the financial system, well, number one, I, d I don't think it's Armageddon because ultimately much of the financial system in this day and age is about Slicing, dicing, organizing, reorganizing various claims on uh, on interest, basically on income streams, on, on interest payments. So all debt cancellation would do uh, is really to say, well, we're going to have a reduction in the outstanding stock of debt, but it invites the kind of financial system to then reorganize, slight reconstitute, re-slice, re-dice. Uh, a different set of, 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 of a kind of a different debt stock. Um, so what happens for, you know, and in the end, we have to remember that the global financial system is already incredibly unstable as it is right now. Uh, rising default rates on any one of, of, of the thousands of different types of, of, of stock debt products that are, uh, you know, that are pooled together, securitized, uh, or whether they're covered bonds or securitized assets, you know, all the different uh, standard debt products, a rising default rate on any of them could trigger the next crisis. So it is not already a kind of stable supply side system, right? It is already inherently fragile. So there is another crisis coming um, sooner rather than later. And, and in that respect, debt cancellation plays a role in providing a different remedy to that crisis than the one that we dealt with last. So what happens in the financial system is that effectively the, the, the receivables have to be restructured, right? There, we have to have a new schedule, a new asset profile for, uh, for example, if we took uh, the pooling of credit, so the debt swaps for high interest uh, household loans for, for lower interest, uh, some sort of government pool. That would just require, uh, you know, again, that would be a new securitized product. These pools are replenished every six months, every year anyway. Uh, you know, this would be about another round of kind of repooling claims, slicing and dicing and charging fees all along the way, no doubt, which isn't actually a, a huge change from what happens now. But it does provide um, temporary relief. What debt cancellation would do in the long term, though, is precisely to introduce ideas of downside risk, right? To precisely um, force lenders to accept that um, not every debt that they issue will be repaid in full. And therefore, they have to bear, you know, if, if debt is easily created, it can easily be eliminated. And therefore, the game for them becomes different. Now, I'm not a a great believer. I don't know if it's because of the the kind of bankers I interact with, or you know, because of the history of the city of London and Wall Street. I mean, 
I think the idea that Armageddon, that the financial industry would face Armageddon, um, I, I just don't believe it. I think they would just reinvent themselves as they do with every crisis to, to, to provide liquidity. I mean, ultimately, my point is that financial re-regulation post-crisis, even if it's implemented, isn't going to prevent the next financial crisis. So we already have a process of re-regulation, recapitalizing the banks, new uh, what counts as collateral, you know, all these kind of... Uh, initiatives, right? And even if they're implemented, we'll do nothing to deal with the current debt stock and most certainly will not prevent the crisis that's coming now. What debt cancellation does to reorganize the system is to kind of begin to introduce new time horizons. So should we really have 30-year loans? Should we really have uh, open-ended credit contracts, like credit cards that can go on for eight, nine years? I mean, they say, for example, bankers say that credit cards are short-term lending facilities. Well, the research that I did into the securitized assets of credit cards were that 80% uh, of credit card holders have a balance for longer than five years. So, you know, if that's the case, then do I imagine we say, okay, uh, if you have a credit card balance for longer than two years, you get moved on to a different product. You know, this is about restructuring the banking industry so that, you know, small institutions make small scale loans, medium sized institutions make medium sized loans and large institutions make la large loans. That is a, a way of combating liquidity. Does debt cancellation achieve that? No, but can the banking, my question is, can the financial system be restructured in that way without debt cancellation? I doubt it, right? So debt cancellation is about providing that kind of, um, that movement to reform, that necessary kind of structural uh, change, you know, let the banks have a bit of structural adjustment for once. Um, but that I believe the liquidity will come after because again, the reason why we have so much debt is because of how easy it is to create. It really is about electronic registers of, of, of assets and liabilities, who owes what to whom. Uh, it doesn't, oh, sorry, it doesn't require, um, in the same way that intermediated banking did, that people who had deposits now lose them, right? People who had savings will not lose their savings. Nobody has savings anyway, note to self, not many people do anyway. Um, so that liquidity will be created because debt cancellation will enable the necessary structural reform of the financial system. So that's kind of how I'm answering those three questions. That's what I hope would happen. Because again, the point is always that debt cancellation cannot be done in isolation. It has to be part of um, other efforts at reform. But what are the, the kind of macro con uh, consequences and the, and the secondary consequences, which again, I think feeds into this, are we just believing that debt cancellation will fuel another consumption boom? And, you know, I certainly hope not, right? And that's not the point of this. But again, that's about asking a question about what do you do when you don't pay, when you're not using that income to pay your debts? Do you go out and engage in a huge consumer boom? Or do you invest in green jobs or, you know, are the kind of tax uh, implications of a debt write-off, could that be part of funding in green jobs? I mean, these are different questions that have to be done in conjunction with a kind of, a, again, a new radical imaginary of what kind of future do we build? Uh, because there ain't no going back, unfortunately. Um, and the idea of the next cycle is probably what I would tackle first, is that we're not looking at funding the next cycle of credit and consumption and, and booming asset values. We're looking at using credit as a public good to provide provisioning, to provide not growth, but um, basic reproductive functions. Again, like the, I don't believe the average household economy, uh, you know, the, the, or the average household within the kind of household sector actually wants to grow in the way a business wants to grow or a way in which the kind of logic of capitalism is of profit and growth. The average household wants to reproduce itself, right? Uh, do households want to engage in buy-to-let property markets? Of course they do, but why, right? It's not a, an inherent, you know, uh, profit rent-seeking kind of behavior of individuals. We see the rise of the buy-to-let market coincide directly with cheap credit, people who had access to cheap housing, able to kind of create their nest egg by having two or three small properties. Big, huge property owning companies having access to cheap credit, able to borrow 
50 billion pounds in a go to buy up entire uh, stock of council housing, right? So it is credit itself that is driving um, the kind of consolidation of financialized assets. So therefore, through debt cancellation, I believe we will, as a byproduct, destabilize paper valued assets in a way that would be good. Because ultimately, if all liquidity does is pump up asset values in a boom and bust cycle, then maybe we maybe the problem is too much liquidity, not the fear of not enough. That makes sense. That one's a bit technical. Great. Well, we'll take a few more questions, and then for anything else, maybe you'd like to join us for a reception in the senior common room in the main building for some wine and nibbles with Jonah and Ben afterwards. So I'm going to take one, two, and then three. And then two. Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. Probably true. <laughs>
was a good one. Um, actually, I'll answer, I'll answer that one first because the um, I learned a lot from the people who you know were doing the research into this kind of debt-free living. Uh, you know, I read all the self-help books. Um, I did some, you know, we did some research into the, the consumer forums, you know, with, with these people engaged in debt-free living. And at first, you know, I thought these were really just people who had sort of completely internalized the logic of, 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 of austerity and, and, and debt repayment. These were like, it's all my fault. I'm morally responsible for all of this. I need to do whatever I, I can. And what instead, what I found in these kind of forums um, was really a kind of a rejection of consumerism and a rejection of a financialized way of life. They, they have it, they call it the light bulb moment, right? So they call it the moment you realize that your debts are so big, it will destroy your life and it's totally pointless. Like the PlayStation you bought, the, the holiday, you know, so there's this woman who's got this uh, great, um, she's one of the kind of gurus of this, but she invites you to write a breakup letter with your debt. And I mean, that is just for me was reading that was, I mean, it, it really kind of typified to me what you're saying about the consumer culture. You know, you're supposed to say like, dear debt, we had a great run, didn't we? Remember when we went to Thailand on that last minute holiday? Remember when we bought the kitchen extension? I loved picking out those tiles with you. You know, and it's like you write this really emotional, you know, letter to your debt and you kind of say, but you're killing me. You know, you're destroying the family. I'm up late at night. Like you're a pro, you know, you, and I and I need to be done with you now. Uh, and and you ha and you kind of say, and I thought, you know, in this way, it's kind of a recognition of the temptation of consumer life, and at the same time, a kind of disavowal of 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 ultimately financialized subject, you know, subjectivity. Like I I'm prepared. And, they, and then they talk, these support groups are about them supporting each other to kind of not get into debt. So um, my whole family hates me because I'm not going to my uncle's funeral, but I can't afford it without putting it on a credit card and they won't understand, right? They don't understand. I won't go into debt. And everybody's like, it's okay. You know, you have to make this commitment to your future. You know, like, so they, the way in which they, this isn't just as simple as you give people money and they go out and spend it because people are kind of unthinking consumers. It's actually that the material, psychological, emotional effects of debt have reach so deep into the intimacies of life these days. I mean, if you imagine nowadays you're a 15 year old kid, whether you have a bank account in your whole life, you have to decide now, are you going to go to university? What degree are you going to take? And will it be worth 50,000 pounds of debt slavery for the rest of your life? I mean, this is like, we're asking little children, you know, who have very limited responsibility. This is what they have to, and I'm complicit in it as a lecturer, which is something I have a really hard time with. But, you know, we have to understand that, you know, the, one of the quotes I always use is the pregnant woman who's talking about trying to pay off her credit card before the baby comes because she has minimal maternity and... Uh, so on. And she's like, you know, I can't believe I, I, I can't pay off my credit card. You know, the baby's coming. Like debt is right there with the birth of a baby. Like this debt is going to live in our family. It's going to keep getting, you know, and it's that way in which debt intrudes into these intimacies of life that I think actually is ripe for a kind of way in which debt forgiveness can be part of a, a, a push against consumerism. Uh, in that respect, because what does that debt s kind of symbolize in a way is that it could potentially be part of that is what is what I would like to see. Um, but in terms of the kind of hierarchy of what's possible, um, I quite like that. I may steal it. Um, <laughs> and we can't I think what I mean, what I mean by we can't go backward is that. Um, and I would say that about social provisioning as well is like I have no desire uh, to kind of revive a job seekers allowance that defines your access to social provisioning based on your full-time empl employment contract and this is what, what we have in other places as well you play a form of insurance how long you're in full-time employment is actually directly kind of related to your right to access unemployment benefits or something I would be looking more towards a guaranteed income more of a kind of direct provisioning for the household sector. And in, and your point is well taken that having a well-funded social security system is more radical a suggestion than debt cancellation. I, I believe that because 
in this day and age, it just seems totally unpalatable that for some reason, the politics says that the state shouldn't be provisioning for the household sector who are also the main taxpayers in this country anyway. Uh, I find that a little bit contradictory. But is it possible... I wouldn't want debt cancellation to be used to kind of reprivatize social security. Rather, I would want debt cancellation to be a recognition that social security has been privatized through debt. So medical debt, debt taken on unemployment, that those types of debt should be forgiven. If you can show, for example, the research done by Step Change showed that 45% of their claimants who are in major financial distress were because they had a drop in income due to unemployment. So they were unemployed, they got a loan to, to plug the gap, three months, four months, then they got a job and the debt burden that, that, ha that, that had to be serviced through employment meant that they were in still in huge financial distress. So we have entire kind of welfare and employment policies that imagine a world where when you get back in employment, you're back in solvency. And the reality of debt is different, that indebtedness is reconfiguring what it means to, to kind of be financially precarious. It's not just that you're unemployed. You can be fully employed and still be financially precarious because of the debt that you carry. So you should be able to cancel debt that was incurred strictly in times of unemployment or have moratorium or something like that. These kind of proposals already exist. Um, but I would hope that debt cancellation could be work, could be used in conjunction with a form of uh, direct provisioning. More importantly, I would add that if we are to get rid of the good credit, bad debt moral economy, part of that is about asking, can credit actually be used as a form of direct provisioning? Can, uh, you know, for example, if the government provided instead of a, of a dividend, it said, okay, well, uh, we'll provide you with £2,000 free overdraft. Right? Interest-free, like, like the social fund, but you don't apply for it because you have need. You apply for it, you know, as a kind of government-sponsored overdraft so that you can make a shortfall. Uh, could that, is that not a way to d deliver social security? Uh, you know, like, does, is it that it's interest-bearing that would be a problem? Or could it be free credit? Could it be like an overdraft? Do you see what I mean? Like, the liquidity that kind of the contemporary financial system can offer through its kind of, uh, the, through the organization of credit, can credit not become something like a public good? Something that actually provides provisioning for the household sector, not something that is purely always a bad thing. Uh, I don't know. That's the kind of question I would like to explore, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, I'm not against provision based on need. I'm against only provision based on need because those need requirements can be so easily determined through kind of very, um, you know, it can, it's too easily manipulated to say, well, you know, you need to be this desperate in order to qualify. Like for the social fund, for example, you would have have to have maxed out all of your benefits, all of your, you know, all the other entitlements you had before you could have made a hundred pound loan interest free from the government. I mean, why? Why can't, why do people have to jump through so many hoops just to access something that is literally can be created that easily? You see, like the, 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 the determining of need creates such a bureaucratic oversight that that is, you know, the kind of reaching down into the, you know, in which we're relying on technocrats to kind of determine what need is rather than actually acknowledging that, uh, then I see your point. Like, what about the people who need it most? They should get more? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Of need. Okay. But yeah, I would be saying that you would have access to this overdraft in a time of need, right? Like, you would have access to it or... Maybe you could use it all the time. I don't know. But that's, I'm saying is that these shouldn't be just determined by those that are worthy. Because that's the part about Ben's comment that 
that's precisely what I wouldn't want is to kind of determine benchmarks of worthiness for debt forgiveness, rather to say that we can all benefit from debt cancellation and we should all have access to, or at least uh, the bottom 80 percent of income earners should have, or household sector should have access to provisioning from the state rather than just the 10 most over indebted. I think that's more what I'm trying to say. Well, I think that's the perfect kind of topic for, for us to discuss further over a glass of wine. I think, I'll um, need 10 glasses of wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A free glass of wine in the senior common room in the main building. So if you'd like to all join me in thanking Jonah and Ben for sharing their evening with us.